It's an honor for me to introduce Mr. Robert uh, E. Quinn. Mr. Ro uh, and he's known as Bob Quinn. Nice. So he's uh, Bob joined Applied Research Associates, ARA, in the year 2012 as division manager, unmanned and security system products working out uh, of the RALF, VT engineering and manufacturing faci facility. His role was to help transition ARA's unmanned systems uh, capabilities for unmanned air, ground, and unattended grounded sensors from a largely project research and development approach to a sustained production and environment. He was promoted to the vice president in the year 2015. Prior joining to ARA, Bob was a VP in Quintet Q North America's QA Technology Solution Group, helping to grow and sustain in unmanned ground system businesses from 10 million to single product business to a multi facet business with sustainable revenues over $100 million. Prior to joining to QuintiQ, Bob was the president and CEO of Statement Corporation, a 40 million US dollar company, especially metals and company servicing aerospace, defense and medical device markets. Bob received a BA in Tufts University and an MBA from Bobscon College. He has 18 years of experience of board experience serving on private, public and not-for-profit boards. He has been an alumni admissions interviewer at Tufts University for 22 years a mentor to undergraduate at Bobson College over five years. Bob was the principal, sp principal spokesperson in QNA's unmanned system business appearings in numerous televisions, prints venues, and was the recognized as subject matter expert and speaker in the military and unmanned grounds. It's an honor to uh, have you amongst us. Thank you so much for joining, and over to you, sir. Thank you very much for. Uh for listening to me. Uh, I hope you can understand my English. It is truly English, but it's uh, a Boston English. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Ram and Swatantra Foundation for inviting me. Uh, I, I want to, you may wonder, why am I here? I think the reason I'm here is the world has changed particularly the defense world, has changed dramatically, and very dramatically over the last 60 days, beginning when Prime Minister Modi visited the U.S., met with President Biden on several occasions. He addressed the joint session of Congress. He had a marvelous state dinner at the White House. The press was all over him. He had large crowds throughout the nation. Um, a few weeks later, it was announced that uh, India was invited to submit a application that would be approved, presumably, for 31 Predator drones, and Predators were not allowed in India for up until this point. Um, to us in the defense industry, that really made a statement that India market is open to defense companies. and. Uh, the warm welcome he received was, was so important. Uh, and then, of course, what, what, two, three weeks ago, India landed on the moon, the South Pole, for the first time of any nation doing so, at an incredibly low cost. Incredibly low cost. And congratulations to India for uh, that technical achievement. So lastly, the war in Ukraine has changed warfare as we know it, as some of the prior conversations two presenters before me outlined. In today's paper, we read about yet another multi-rotor, vertical launched, a small UAS on the air system, uh, costing about $500 Defeat, with a video of it defeating a Russian T-90 main battle tank costing over three million dollars. And we're seeing once again the low-cost indigenous manufacture of 
small UAS as a loitering submunition being able to take out very, very expensive platforms. In the US for the last hundred or more years, the focus of the military has been on platforms, big platforms like the Predator platform. Uh, what the war in Ukraine has really shown is that small indigenous produced low cost devices is, is and will continue to change and, and that's, that's why I'm here. We felt it was time to come to India, India because we cannot produce low cost items. And we believe that countries like India will procure the big platforms like Predator, but they will also generate internally much smaller systems that are hugely effective in the battlefield, but at an affordable price with indigenous manufacture. The, I should have mentioned that in the Predator decision that was announced July 3rd, um, in addition to buying the 31 aircraft, India will be allowed to manufacture and assemble some of those aircraft as they're into the program and have a uh, repair facility here in India to repair it. So again, there's much more, the whole idea of India manufacture uh, is now on the table in, in a very big way. Had Prime Minister Modi not visited, none of this would have happened in my personal opinion. Um, consequently, Bob Quinn is now here in Chennai. My first trip to India, I, I've traveled the world. I've been to 36, 37 countries. My first to India, and I must say, I will be back. Um, the, um, we are a defense contractor. Um, and being an international conference, we're required by our export control laws to, to run our briefing material and our words in front of um, our, our legal organization so that they can review things to make sure there's no technology transfer. So there is no technology transfer, there is no uh, classified information. Uh, but I've been encouraged to read from my remarks rather than speaking contemporaneously just to make sure there's no uh, transfer of technology, which there won't be. So pardon me, I really much prefer talking off the cuff. I'm an affectionate, for 20 years I've been involved in defense robotics. Um, I love the aspect of it being a young person sport, men and women, um, uh, interestingly, one of the questions earlier was about software versus hardware. Twenty years ago, mechanical and electrical engineers were the leaders of our robotics groups, the small input from software. Of the 2,000 employees at ARA, when it started, it was mostly civil engineers looking at how Air Force munitions would affect structures whether they be deep buried caves or uh, urban settings. Today, uh, in the robotics and overall company, it's software, 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 software. And in 20 years time, we've seen that inversion where software engineering, engineering is really taking the lead. And that's the strength of India. Uh, another reason why they said, Bob, please get to India. So I said, yes, boss. Um, so now with my prepared remarks. Uh, these are the five topics that I'll be uh, discussing today, which my intent here is to provide you a history of the last 20 years of defense robotics in the United States through the prism of Applied Research Associates role. There are many other companies in the U.S. working the field but I'm going to just look at some of the things that we have done. More importantly, it's shifting to the current and the future. And I really want to end and spend more time not about what we've done in the last 20 years, but rather what's coming. I think the uh, aspect of what's coming, particularly related to unmanned ground vehicles, uh, is staggering. Um, and I hope that this presentation uh, leads you to that same conclusion. So it's the last items, item four and five in this list, that I hope to spend most of my time talking about and answering your questions. So 44 years ago, four US Air Force retirees 
uh, in New Mexico created a consulting business. As I mentioned, they were civil engineers. Today we have over 2,000 employee owners. It's an unusual business structure. ARA is a 100% employee owned company. So all of us as employees are employee owners. We uh, all benefit with the success uh, or the lack of success. Fortunately, the company has been profitable 44 years in a row. And uh, we have a superb reputation in the field, uh, mostly for the US military. There are multiple sites you see on this map. The sites in blue uh, represent the ARA offices. The sites in red represent military bases and other customer locations where ARA personnel are on scene. And I mentioned we're now uh, over $500 million or 42 billion rupee in, in revenues. ARA Work is a diversified company uh, working in four areas, national security, energy and environment, infrastructure, health solutions. Uh, but 80% of our business is in the upper uh, left box, the national security. Uh, fully 77% of our employees, of the 2,000 employees, have, advanced, uh, have degrees in their technical degrees. Um, and more than 50% have advanced degrees, so masters and PhD. So we're, we're, not, we're a high-tech uh, group of engineers and scientists who are working to the benefit of the U.S. military. 90% of our business is with the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, only 5% is commercial. Uh, we also do work for state level governments in the civil engineering and transportation field. But that is also government in that where the, I come from Massachusetts, uh, other states have their own departments of transportation and we essentially are the technical advisors to the transportation boards that approve road projects, bridges and, and, uh, and other roads and road, road, roadways where we do the technical evaluation on their behalf. But that still is government, and that's why 90% is government. Um, for 30 years, or nearly 30 years, we've been working with unmanned systems uh, for both fixed wing aircraft that are hand launched. One of the videos this morning showed the Raven Back in 2003, ARA and Aero Environment, who makes the Raven, were in a competition by the U.S. Air Force. And Raven won, and our Nighthawk, same, roughly the same size vehicle, lost out. Aero Environment has gone on to become a sole source for hand, hand launched. Good morning, everybody. We arranged business to business meeting. If anybody is interested, please come to star number 179 to make arrangement for the B2 meeting. Uh, yeah, okay, and so in addition to fixed wing aircraft that we have designed directly for the Air Force, um, we're not a production supplier because now Air Environment is a sole source. They're birds, uh, they're not $25,000 that I saw, they're hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, competition has, a, when, particularly when you're a sole source, uh, boy, they're making a ton of money, and, uh, but very, very, very expensive. Um, uh, our birds were as good, but we did not have in-country support in Iraq uh, at the time, uh, and Air Environment did. Another indication of logistics that was mentioned earlier, logistics and logistics support is hugely important for sustainability of whatever fleet you have. Um, our main thrust has been in ground vehicles, not the small robots that you saw a picture of, that personally I was involved in in, in my prior company, um, but very large picture. It's too bad that these photographs are so small uh, the vehicles that we're working with, a lot of heavy equipment and heavy trucks, they're much, much bigger. It's not the small robots, it's the big vehicles. 
So most of my con conversations are going to be about vehicle robotics. We basically can transform any vehicle or piece of manned equipment into an unmanned systems at the flip of a switch in usually less than an hour after the particular model has been designed with the right uh, hardware uh, for attachments. Every vehicle is going to have different hardware attachments. So once you have the model fixed in, it's a one hour transfer to go from a manned system to an unmanned system at literally a flip of a switch. And that's been our really claim to fame. In the upper right hand picture, you'll see one of our vehicles with a payload. The military has started looking at multi-mission payloads. This happens to be a, uh, a minigun. Uh, the U.S. and our adversaries have been working with uh, weapons on small robots for over 20 years. They've not made it to the battlefield yet because of the lack of autonomy, but many, many decades of work have all, have all gone into that. Now, robotic equipment always has two sides, the equipment on the vehicle and the equipment carried by the remote operator. When you see the video that was played earlier today, you saw the little robot running around. What you didn't see is the operator. There were a few pictures of the operator do, doing the manual controls. Um, on the vehicle side, we've created a, a vehicle interface controller that is standard across our platforms. Uh, it has standard hardware and approved software with redundant safety features. There's also a teleop kit creating a layered network with radios, cameras, and software. And then on the far right, an advanced autonomy kit uh, with more advanced hardware and software for off-road navigation with obstacle detection and avoidance. For the remote operator, we connect with a wide variety of mesh network or point-to-point -point radios, handheld controllers, and a variety of video screens, depending on the mission. Remote control uses the operator's eyes and ears to control the vehicle, while teleoperation uses onboard cameras to extend the operational standoff from just 300 meters to about two kilometers line of sight for teleoperation using low power radios in order to avoid RF interference with other radio transmissions on the battlefield. Generally, there are five levels of autonomy with remote control and teleoperation being the most widely used but a very limited value for high-speed, large defense vehicles. They work well for slow-moving vehicles that require constant human control. Remote control uses the operator's eyes and ears, as I mentioned, and teleoperation uses the cameras. Our M Razor X vehicle, as shown in this picture, was in partnership with Polaris Defense, the equipment manufacturer. It was field tested in 2018-2019 by the U.S. Army as part of a runoff between four SMET, Squad Multi-Mission Equipment Transport Vehicle Systems. As the photos show, our equipment is optionally unmanned. In other words, a human can jump into that front seat and drive it away at the flip of a switch. We thought that until better vehicle autonomy becomes available, having the ability to either drive the vehicle instead of towing it would be advantageous. However, human nature being what it is, soldiers prefer driving this vehicle at outrageous speeds, furiously, and when you saw the op soldier operators, I personally saw them coming out, they, had a, they wore a safety helmet because of the speed, and they had a grin from ear to ear how happy they were driving this uh, diesel electric high-powered vehicle off-road. They thought it was an amusement ride. 
Who wants to drive a teleoperation machine at 10 miles an hour when I can drive at 60 to 70 miles an hour? And the, the, the thrill, if you saw the thrill on the soldier faces, you'd say, damn, what, what, a, what a great ride that is. Unfortunately, the Army wanted an unmanned system, not a optionally manned system. So our, our assessment was wrong. We did not win the contract. General Dynamics won the contract. Interestingly, they uh, provided a teleoperated vehicle that is, looks like a, a flatbed with wheels underneath. And the flatbed is to be able to carry the soldier's gear and also, importantly, launch U small UAVs. We've been awarded multiple contracts for the Army to roboticize Humvees of multiple configurations. The Army still has over 100,000 Humvees in its inventory, and these old trucks are very difficult to drive. These vehicles are also prone to rollovers at high speed and have caused many training deaths over the years. Generally, 10 to 12 soldiers die every year from training at U.S. and foreign bases because these vehicles are so top-heavy they have a hard time controlling them. Consequently, we've been tasked by the Army with adding vehicle safety technology along with optionally unmanned capability. We've installed what's called advanced driver assist systems into a variety of Humvees that have gone through extensive Army reliability and safety testing. These modern vehicle assist features are what our young soldiers are used to in their personal autos before becoming soldiers. Our ADAS systems include two EO cameras, one stereo camera, one infrared camera, three short range radars, and one long range radar. When I said earlier software is taking, taking over, there's also a lot of hardware. I just described a lot of hardware. In order to go robotic, you need the hardware, but you also need the intelligence in the software. In the bottom right hand, you'll see four features that have already been approved. Lane departures, forward collision, you can read. And the two at the bottom in red are yet to be approved by the Army. For unmanned ground vehicles to operate at speed in complex, difficult off-road terrain, higher levels of autonomy are required. Here are the three higher levels of autonomy that have been undergoing development and testing for more than a decade. Autonomy is intended to be added through software improvements, along with lower cost sensors that will become more affordable as unmanned cars and trucks become ubiquitous on our highways. Military operations must assume that GPS will be blocked by the enemy, so all these autonomy capabilities must take that into account. Additionally, off-road operations are hindered by tall grass, trees, poles, buildings, ditches, waters, and even humans. Unmanned air vehicles and unmanned surface naval vessels, by comparison, don't have uh, anywhere near these many obstacles. It is why unmanned ground vehicles operating at speed is so much further behind, at least 10 years, from unmanned air vehicles or unmanned naval vessels. Advanced autonomy is very challenging even by using a mix of radars, cameras, and lidars. Progress continues to be made and we are proud of our performance at Army test sites against several competitors and OEMs. We can operate continuously today on the first pass of a new test area without GPS or preloaded maps for several hours in exceedingly difficult terrain having many obstacles. After the first pass, follow-on passes of the same course are completed much faster. 
We believe this autonomy can today safely and reliably go there, come here, follow me, and return home for missions lasting four to eight hours. Collecting wounded from the battlefield is a good example, as is launching a robotic, vehicle-borne IED against enemy positions from many kilometers away. I've already mentioned the historic role of slow-moving unmanned ground vehicles, and you saw the videos from the Iraq War using remote control or teleoperation. Going forward, the role of military unmanned ground vehicles will expand significantly as autonomy levels increase. The U.S. Marine Corps has been experimenting with weaponized unmanned ground vehicles together with UAVs for over a decade. They view the unmanned ground vehicle as a land-based aircraft carrier to launch and recover small UAVs while at the same time carrying direct or indirect fire heavy weapons as well as critical soldier supplies like water and ammo. Experimenting with multi-vehicle robotic breaching is of very high interest since this task has historically resulted in the highest casualty rates for our soldiers. There are many examples of ongoing robotic vehicle testing and evaluation from multiple OEMs. We have always partnered with U.S. military vehicle manufacturers who value our robotic experience and working with our passionate employee owners. Picture here is work with AM General on the left and Polaris and FLIR on the right. Continuous integration and testing of platform agnostic multi-mission payloads and autonomy improvements are critical to creating a robust, reliable, easy-to-use robotic capability that our soldiers will love to operate while keeping far and away and hidden from the enemy. For military equipment, soldiers are very, very good at separating the wheat from the shaft. If you deliver equipment that's too hard to, to learn and isn't reliable, they will leave it aside and not bring it with them. And very quickly, you will no longer be a supplier to the military. Um, you saw in the video earlier today two different sized robots. Um, uh, they were both, and, as well as the big dog that's not yet in, in production. I don't know if it ever will. But these explosive ordnance disposal robots, it began with six different robots. Four of them fell by the wayside because they were not reliable and rugged and only two survived. And that happened in less than six months. So if you were one of the suppliers that, of those six machines that didn't have robust reliability and ease of use, soldiers very quickly in time of war particularly just felt it was a, they're already carrying too much baggage. They don't need more, particularly more that they can't rely on. So ARA has been funded by DARPA and the U.S. Army to develop augmented reality for dismounted soldiers and more recently inside manned infantry fighting vehicle. Augmented reality, or AR, is particularly good for navigation and greatly improves situational awareness about where you are, where your friends are, and where the enemy is, all in real time. When movement to contact routes are suddenly blocked by the enemy, augmented reality can quickly superimpose new routing maps, maps to friendly forces using heads-up displays. The Navy has funded ARA to develop man-portable laser that can be used to render safe or IEDs and unexploded ordnance from a safe distance. It's also being tested to bring down small unmanned air vehicles. This technology was initially thought to be impossible to miniaturize, but we've had very numerous successful customer demonstrations at military sites in the U.S. against a whole range of targets, both IEDs, UXOs, and 
small unmanned air vehicles. Directed energy laser technology is still immature, but it will eventually make it into future battlefields. After decades of testing and evaluation, the Army and Marine Corps are on schedule to first unit equip remote combat vehicle light, pictured at the top, in 2028, and remote combat vehicle medium, pictured at the bottom, in 2030, with advanced autonomy and additional payloads added incrementally. Meanwhile, testing and evaluation are ongoing on several optionally unmanned vehicles taken from the Army's current inventory of manned equipment. As this briefing shows, without advanced autonomy, these systems will never make it to the battlefield. It's hugely important that soldiers are not teleoperating these vehicles. They have to move, and, and uh, I mentioned several use cases, like go there, come to me, return home. It has to be simple for soldiers to operate. You don't want to have to use a touch screen and put navigation way, waypoints. We do that all behind the scenes, but a soldier simply has to say, come to me, go there, return home, bring help some type of simple message that makes a reliable, rugged experience for our soldiers. This is an interesting book that you should all read if you're interested in the future of warfare. The idea of warfare has always been to kill the enemy before he kills you. In the early 1970s, U.S. Air Force Colonel John Boyd, he was an air combat ace, came up with the OODA loop as a way to win in combat. Observe, orientate, decide, and act faster than the enemy. The future proliferation of sensors in space, in air, sea, and ground absolutely require AI conflation of these disparate sensor information, speeding kill chain closure by providing soldiers with the best options to take action. Closing the sensor to shoot a kill chain is of paramount importance, as is breaking the enemy's kill chain with technology and new tactics. AI will play an ever increasing and crucial role in this endeavor by increasing the speed by which our soldiers understand where the enemy is relative to friendly forces and the best available weapons and munitions they have at their disposal. This book explains how AI and robotics, along with a plethora of intelligent sensors, communicating instantaneously through ad hoc, resilient mesh networks, will be the next revolution in military affairs, forever changing the future of military conflict. ARA has deep experience quickly creating three-dimensional georectified synthetic maps using AI and machine learning. Inputs come from satellites, manned and unmanned air vehicles, cell phones, stationary fixed cameras to create the 3D georectified accurate maps. The maps are used for pre-raid training and be, can be quickly modified during operations by inserting operational updates from UAVs and manned aircraft. Tr These three-dimensional maps can also be used for vehicle autonomy testing. It's much cheaper to run thousands of iterations through software to create a priori information prior to actually putting that robotic vehicle into operations. It has a historic memory. The, the key about these three-dimensional maps is their accuracy and the ability to uh, know where they are in a GPS-denied environment. And you're taking a synthetic environment 
operationalizing the data to increase its utility to actual soldiers. They train better and they fight better because they know where they are because they've seen it before and they've been able to use the software to go through iterations prior to uh, going in harm's way. So our contribution to closing the sensor to shooter kill chain is to combine these five steps. Step one is 3D terrain generation that I just discussed, followed by mission rehearsal, operational augmented reality, robotic autonomy and AI enhanced mission planning, concluding with indoor mapping, navigation and telepresence allowing soldiers to be able to hook up with telepresence with subject matter experts anywhere in the world. So as they are inside a building or come across something unusual, they will be able to use telepresence to get an opinion from an expert somewhere in the world of what it is that they're actually looking at. So the war in Ukraine has shown the importance of small unmanned air vehicles and small unmanned surface naval vessels on the battlefield and how AI speeds the processing of data from disparate sensors into reliable targeting information. Consider the impact of personal cell phones used by Russian troops to provide targeting information to friendly forces from a multitude of weapons it has at its disposal. No longer will soldiers be able to gather in groups of hundreds and have cell phones and think that they are safe from being attacked by the enemy from very long distances. The world has changed on the battlefield. We've seen this in Iraq, in uh, uh, Ukraine. Um, very quickly, tactics are going to have to change. Troops are going to have to be... Uh, uh, distributed throughout the battlefields, command and control sta stations with large outposts are history. They have to change. The speed and tempo of the battlefield is going to be dramatically different, and you're going to see that whenever the next war breaks out. The U.S. and Russia have both been experimenting with armed unmanned ground vehicles for over a decade. But until autonomy levels improve, these robotic machines will probably remain on the sidelines until the next war. Meanwhile, Ukraine is using unmanned ground vehicles in very small numbers to transport wounded soldiers from the battlefield to waiting ambulances. Last week, the U.S. Air Force announced that it is seeking production funding from Congress for over 1,000 XQ-58 Valkyrie stealth, unmanned combat air vehicles for its wingman concept to fly alongside the F-35 fighter. The Navy has an unmanned submarine called Orca that has been undergoing extensive testing and evaluation for future force implementation. Having thousands of low-cost air, sea, and land-based unmanned systems will close the kill chain for friendly forces and break the kill chain for enemy forces by the sheer number of expendable or attributable unmanned systems they will be facing. Large quantities of low-cost indigenous unmanned systems are likely here to stay. And in India, ARA can be an excellent partner, particularly with unmanned ground systems and small unmanned air system technology. We hope to find partner companies here that we can work with in a mutually beneficial way. Um, and that concludes my talk. I, I think I will apologize for talking about the kill chain. It's, it's not a subject that you like to talk about. Um, I've had personal experience uh, meeting soldiers and Marines, uh, and these robots have kept them alive. And uh, I believe the life-saving aspects to friendly for forces are pa paramount to the business that we are in. But I'll, I'll end where I began. The world has changed. 
and it has changed uh, such that India has a huge opportunity now to develop indigenous, low-cost robotic equipment for air, land, and sea to be able to protect itself and its uh, citizens in the years and decades ahead. So are there other questions? Yeah, so the low cost is in relation to U.S. systems. So uh, we don't make low cost systems. We, we make very expensive systems. And so, um, so low cost is a relative term. And relative to what we produce and what is specified by the U.S. military, low cost is, um, is very similar to what you're seeing in, in Ukraine. And even the, the Russian system is rumored to be what, just $35,000 a piece for its, its small and main air systems. They're building factories to produce them by the thousands. Uh, interesting, Australia has delivered cardboard UAVs. Can you imagine cardboard UAVs? Cardboard-like. And they're shipped in pallets of 25 stacked one on top of the other, if you haven't seen the photographs. So avionics become the central cost, but the manufacture of the hardware is becoming very, very low cost. And yes, you're going to need big platforms, but now what's apparent is that small, relatively low cost systems. The next and the next be session will be on the. Yes. Uh, is it correct that uh, the drone supplied by Iran yes. has got piston engines? Are what? Piston engines. Piston. The old aircraft that used to go with propellers and piston engines. With that also, they have made drones and supplied to Russia. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding the question. I know about the Iranian drones that have been provided and, to Russia. And, and, and what, is the, what is the power they have used? Is it piston engines? Simple piston engines, what is used in automobiles? Um, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and since this is uh, mostly a PDP forum, uh, uh, and uh, since the US uh, defense and the defense laws and regulations, uh, both in the US as well as even in other countries, are uh, extremely uh, uh, tedious and, and these sectors are regulated. So, beyond the export control uh, laws, how do you see the opportunities and challenges for partnering uh, with the Indian companies? With, uh, finding, uh, I think it takes time and engagement. And, and without time and engagement, it's all uh, hypothetical. So. I think if you want to uh, meet him, I think he should be in the uh, VIP lounge. You can contact him and discuss with him the further questions, whatever you have to. Now you would like to honor the uh, uh, present presenters. and our Indian defense attaches are waiting and my sincere apologies for over a, a more than an hour delay. I hope uh, they're waiting. Defense attaches are there. Okay, sir, couple of minutes. Uh, we are going into your session. Uh, let me just complete uh, giving the mementos to the uh, just concluded uh, session speakers. Sir. One minute. Sir Ram Subramaniam, President of Svandita Foundation. 
we are honoring the guest, Mr. Bob. Mr. Bob. Mr. Balaji Lakshman. And Mr. Lakshmi Narayan. All the speakers, please stand here. We take a photograph. All set. Should we go?